اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وبه نستعين والصلاة والسلام على خير خلق الله أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين اللهم صل على محمد أما بعد فقد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه الكريم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم هو الذي أنزل السكينة في قلوب المؤمنين صدق الله الحديث الحظيم My dear brothers and sisters in Scotland, England or any other places around the world السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Wa alaykum assalam wa rahmatullah Today I am going to start with a question if you had a walnut in your hand and someone said to you wow what a beautiful pearl you have got how would you react to that um, let me turn it around if you had a pearl if you owned a pearl and someone said to you oh uh, you have got a walnut there how would you react then you see caring about other people's opinions and seeking approval and affirmation from other people is perhaps as old a problem as is the human history but nowadays in this day and age this problem is increasing it is exacerbating in these times when we have all these social media tools and we interact with different types of people online and also offline but more so online twitter instagram facebook and linkedin where we want to share the bright side of our life and we want to share our, our accomplishments and we want to show to the world how happy we are and what we have achieved in life and sometimes we do not get the affirmation or acknowledgement and people have their opinions about us or our choices and we hear what we do not want to hear or we do not hear what we wanted to hear and this brings about anxiety and worries in our lives and as a matter of fact many people around the world are suffering from this and regardless of their faith religion cultural background or languages or ethnicity people's quality of life is being negatively affected by this constant seeking of approval and caring about other people's opinions so what does islam say about this this is what i'm going to address in one part of this lecture you see you know usually i have one topic for the whole lecture and i address that but this program is special and we are of course celebrating the birth anniversary of two of our beloved imams and and i find it very important that i talk about our imams therefore uh, what i'm going to do is that i'm going to divide this lecture into three parts so what you're going to learn during the next 45 minutes or so is the following first of all what is the root cause of caring too much about other people's opinions and seeking approval from them and how we can learn what is the key to getting rid of that and thereby improving our quality of life after that in continuation of that i am going to take a closer look at history and talk about two groups of people who did not understand the status of our beloved imam Musa al-Kawim peace be upon him and then in continuation of that in the last and the final part of this lecture i will take a closer look at history again and talk about some of the aspects of the imam of our beloved imam our master our maula imam taqi al-jawad peace be upon him and then end this lecture with a brief dua insha Allah but before i proceed 
wherever you are, from the bottom of your heart, please recite a beautiful salawat. Oh. In the opening sermon, I recited a part of verse number four of Surah Al-Fatih, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, هُوَ الَّذِي أَنزَلَ السَّكِينَةَ فِي قُلُوبِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ He is the one, it is He, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who sent tranquility into the hearts of the believers of mu'mineen. This verse has a context, and the context is the early years of Islam and the victory of Muslims over the pagans of Mecca. But this verse carries deep messages that can help us understand how we can acquire tranquility and peace and learn not to care too much about other people's opinions. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does what? He sent he sends down. The verse talks about the past, but the reality is that this verse is valid also for the present. And it's a reality, timeless reality that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends peace and tranquility into the hearts of mu'mineen. Now, what is mu'mineen? Mu'mineen is plural of mu'min. And what is the definition of mu'min? One definition of mu'min is the one who creates peace in their own heart or in the hearts of others. In their own heart or in the hearts of others. This is one definition of a believer, of a mu'min. Now, Allah's names, one of Allah's names is also mu'min. Now, the first part of the definition, one who creates peace in his own heart, in their own heart, is not valid for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the second part, Creating peace in others' hearts, that is valid for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he, and only he, sends down tranquility and creates peace into the hearts of believers. But how does he do that? How does he do that? You see, it is the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he works through the wasila, through the means, through the medium. And he has sent Two wasila, two wasail through which he creates peace into the hearts of the believers. First of all, what he calls shifa ulema fi sudur, shifa cure for what is inside the chests. And what is inside the chests? It is a metaphor. Hearts cure for the hearts. What Quran? The Holy Quran is a cure for the hearts, and that is a wasila through which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates peace in the hearts of the believers. And the second wasila is the one upon whose heart Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala descended the Holy Quran, and through his tongue Allah speaks. The one through whose tongues the verbatim word of God is spoken. The Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. And then those who are his progeny, those who inherit all the knowledge and all the attributes and qualities from the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. The 13 infallibles after the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. So then we have two wasail, two means of, of finding peace and tranquility. The Holy Quran and the Kalam of Ma'asumin, the Imma. Lady Fatima, peace be upon her, and the 12 Imams. Their words can help us find solutions to our problems, to our dilemmas, to our anxieties, to our ruminations, worries, and thoughts that can that keep us awake at night. And how can I say that? You see, the example I gave in the very beginning, the pearl and the walnut story, that example, I did not learn it from any motivational speaker. I did not learn it or infer it through the words of a new age guru. No, it is based on a hadith of Imam Musa al kazim peace be upon him, that is included in Al-Kafi. Imam Musa Kazim, peace be upon him, said to Hisham, one of his students, Hisham, if you have a walnut in your hand 
and the people say it is a pill it is going to be of no benefit to you and if you have a pill and people said that it was just a walnut it is not going to harm you as long as you know what is in your hand as long as you know that the imam said that is the translation of that part of the hadith that do not rely upon the discernment and the speech of people people have their own opinions they have their own points of view but their word is not necessarily always the truth you have to know your own self-worth that is the gist of this hadith you have to know your self-worth and then other people's points of view. Their opinions of you are not going to bother you at all. The Imam is telling us. What a beautiful example. And the hadith are full of words of wisdom. Full of gems that we should be looking for. But unfortunately, we do not because we're all too busy and other things and then we go and search google and youtube looking for motivational speakers and others and those who can help us and sometimes they do they have some valuable stuff because allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses different wasila sometimes he makes some motivational speaker who is not even a muslim to convey some words of wisdom that can help you get out of your problem but still we need to first and foremost look into the quran and the kalam of the ma'asumin to find solutions to our problems. So know your self-worth. How can we do that? How can we do that? And how can we learn not to care too much about what other people think about us? You see, the root cause is a little bit complex. It is easier said than done that, oh, you should not care what others think about you or the cliche, what others think about you is none of your business. You know that, I know that, we have heard it many times, but it is easier said than done because this mentality, this thought pattern, this schema in psychology terms is developed from the childhood, from the childhood, unfortunately. And the Muslim majority societies where most of us have our roots in, in the societies of the Middle East and South Asia, from the very childhood, it is taught to children that they should not do certain things because people might not like it. What will people say? You have to have good etiquettes, otherwise people will say, my son or my daughter is so mischievous, has no etiquettes. You have to do good things so that people say, you are good, my children are good. You don't say prayers while I'm in the mosque committee. What will people say? My son is not saying prayers. You're not wearing hijab. I'm sitting in the steering committee of the Imam Barga and you are not wearing hijab. You're not doing proper azadari. What will people say? I was told that in one of the ladies' majlises, um, an elderly, el elderly lady um, brought her uh, daughter-in-law for the first time, or she was newly wed to her son. And after the majlis, she was telling her daughter-in-law, do harder, Matam, harder. Why don't you do harder, Matam? More, more, harder, harder. You know, this is how we tell our children or our grandchildren or you know so that we are worried people might think oh my son-in-law or my daughter-in-law is not a proper azadar instead of all this we would be better off telling our children you should do good things because they are good because allah wants you to do good things and you should stay away from bad things because they are bad intrinsically bad it is intrinsically bad to lie not that what will people say my son is a liar okay let them think have you ever ever been worried what does allah think about you what does ali think about you what does the holy prophet think about you what do the aimma think about you we have to tell our children do things for the sake of god not for the sake of people that shema seeking approval caring about other people's opinions starts from there 
start from there. And as a result of that, people develop low self-esteem. And there are many aspects to it. And, and I have limited time, but I will still spend a, a couple of more minutes on this topic before I move to the second part. Self-worth. If you know your self-worth, then you can learn to get rid of this problem of seeking approval if and seeking acknowledgement if does not if someone does not give you the acknowledgement you you won't be worried or bothered anymore first thing that you have to try to learn to do things for the sake of allah not for the sake of people second learn your self-worth and how can we learn about our self-worth how can we do that you see in order to learn about our self-worth we have to start thinking like god yeah, a little bit. Be like God. Sounds like a wolf laden statement. Our Aima are like God. I say it openly. The 14 infallibles are like God. It's not a wolf laden statement. I'm going to unfold it. We have to think like God to understand our self-worth. What do I mean by that? You know, we can be like God. We actually are a little bit like God in certain aspects. And what do I mean by that? Please bear with me. Please pay attention. I do not want any ambiguities left or any misconceptions. You see, God has given some of his attributes to a very low degree to us as well. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is murid, he has irada. We also have irada. In that sense, we are a little bit like God. Not in that, in qualities, in attributes. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the power of kun fayakun. You also have the power of kun fayakun. When Allah wants something, the irada of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the ijad of the thing he wants are one and the same thing. A theological discussion, I'm not going to make it complex, but please pay attention. You are going to enjoy what I'm going to tell you and you are inshallah going to learn something that is going to improve your quality of life. In the case of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his irada and ijad, when he wants something, and the creation of that something, there is no distance or delay between the two. It's the one and the same thing. You also have that kind of kun fayakun. When you want to imagine something, you want to imagine an apple, a car, a house, a tree, red color, blue, sky, whatever. Is there any delay between your wanting to imagine that and that imagination? No, that is a very low degree of kun fayakun. Only in a virtual world, you cannot create it in the kharij. You cannot bring it outside of your mind immediately. If you want to bring it out, then you have to require many different means and help from others. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not need that. So we can also be a little bit like God. And God has a very high self-esteem because he knows himself and no one knows himself other than he himself. No one can know him other than he himself. He knows his self-worth, what he is, his power, his qualities, his attributes, and the whole world can refuse to accept him and believe in him. The whole world can turn into idolaters and he wouldn't care even a it, and he would still keep giving them food and water and air and all other things they need. And similarly, his representatives, those who are the perfect manifestation of his names and attributes, they are also like God. They couldn't care less what people think about them. The Holy Prophet couldn't care less what Abu Jahl thought about him as a person. The Amir al muminin Ali ibn Abi Talib couldn't care less what the other Sahaba thought about him. Whether others accepted him or not as a person, he couldn't care less. It didn't bother him at all. It didn't hurt his self-esteem at all. He couldn't care less what Muawiyah thought about him. And similarly, Imam Musa al-Kazim, peace be upon him, when he was 
in the dark dungeon of Baghdad. Shackled in chains, he couldn't care less what people thought about him. What an imam! He cannot even get out of the prison himself. The imam couldn't care less what they were thinking. He was not bothered by these thoughts. His worry was how I can help people, how I can lead people towards one God, how I can help people and save them from the fire of hell, how I can help people find salvation. Great people think like that. They are not worried about other people's opinions of them. So this jail, this prison that you and I have created around us, this prison, these shackles, these chains, being worried, anxious, what others might be thinking about me. The others did not give me the acknowledgement for my achievements, my successes. These ruminations, these thoughts, who will bring these, who will break these shackles? Who will break these chains? Who will get us out? Who will help us get out of that? And I'm going to tell you, if we do tawassul, if we do tawassul to the prisoner of Baghdad, and I know today is his birth anniversary and not his martyrdom anniversary, and I'm not going to recite a eulogy. But if we do tawassul to him, he will help us break these shackles, break this prison, break this jail, and pay attention to his words, and pay attention to the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this brings me to the second part of this lecture. I could continue, and I know this is a very important topic, but I have to move on. We have to talk about our Imam. And I will wrap this up, this lecture in the end, and also repeat some of the key points, inshallah. But for now, moving to the second part of this lecture, Imam Musa al kazim peace be upon him. Very special Imam, who was misunderstood by many people misunderstood. You see, in the history, we have two group of people who did not really get it right. The first ones are the those people who separated from the mainstream Shia and made their own group called Ismailia. Who are those people? Let me spend a few minutes on telling you the history of those people and what happened. Why they are called Ismailia? Ismail was the eldest son of Imam Jafar al-Sadiq, peace be upon him. And he was a great man and a pious man. And everybody thought, all the Shia thought, and in their own minds, they had somehow made this reality that he was going to be the next Imam. He was going to be the successor to the Imam, Imam Sadiq, peace be upon him. But what happened? He predeceased Imam Jafar al Sadiq, peace be upon him. Ismail passed away in the life of Imam Jafar al Sadiq, peace be upon him. And some people had a hard time believing that, that he was not the Imam, he was not the next Imam, and instead Imam Musa al Kalim, peace be upon him, was the seventh Imam. So they created a belief. And the belief was that, that he was, Ismail had disappeared somewhere. There were different points of view about Ismail. Some people started to believe that Ismail was the last Imam and he had become the Ghaib Imam and he would reappear at some time. Some people continued to take Muhammad ibn Ismail, the son of Ismail as their Imam and then continued to believe in a whole chain of imams and it continues to it continued for several centuries and later on some people believe that ismail would return and have uh, would be resurrected and have a rajat and then he would become the 
Mahdiya Maw'ud and Al Qaim. Anyway, the Ismailia separated and they became a one important and potent force in the history of Islam. They continued with their imams after the imams and imams. They separated from the main, mainstream. They rejected the, the wilayah, the imam of Imam Musa al-Kazim, peace be upon him. And eventually they ended up having different sects like Nedari, Musta'li, Muhammad Shahi, Nedari, Bohra, Dawoodi, Bohra, and then several sects and subsects and subsects today, they exist in different forms. And the Duru's and some got out of the bound of Islam because they started to develop very strange sort of beliefs. And if you today go and search and you can look for yourself, there is a plethora of sects and subsects of Ismailis. But the mainstream stream, 12 were Shias, they are pretty straightforward. They believe in the 12 Imams and all of them have pretty much the same sort of aqaid and beliefs. And they have pretty much the same sort of fiqh that everybody practices. Regardless of minor differences, some are usuli, some are akhbari, some have this marja, some have that marja, some have some differences of opinion in the wilayat of taqwiniya, this and that, but pretty much a very coherent system. But the Ismailis, they have a, a wide spectrum of beliefs and practices. And through a, in the history, there was one point, and I'm going to make this point because this is very, I find it very important. And it is about our Khoja brothers and sisters. There were one point in time, a lot of people who are Khoja, they converted to Ismailism. And there were very few who converted straight from Hinduism to Isna Ashari, Shia mainstream 12 religion. And then later on, uh, another group from the Ismaili Khoja people separated from them and became Khoja Ithna Ashari Twelvers. And I have a huge respect for those people. And I tend to believe that it must be a special lutf and karam and blessings of Imam Musa al kazim peace be upon him, upon those group of people who separated from the Ismailiya and decided to do tamassuk with Musa al kazim peace be upon him. There must be a special blessing from the Imam Musa al kazim Now this was one group, but then there was another group who believed in Imam Musa al kazim peace be upon him, until the Imam passed away then they separated from the mainstream. They are called waqifiyah. Waqifiyah is rooted in the word tawakuf, waqif, tawakuf, which means stopping. They stopped at the Imam, of Imam Musa al kazim peace be upon him. They said he was the last Imam. And they too had many different strange sort of beliefs about Imam Musa al kazim peace be upon him. For example, some of them rejected outrightly that the Imam was martyred. They believed that the Imam was lifted up. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took him up and saved him like Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him. Some believed that he was never imprisoned and he became Imam Ghaib before even being imprisoned. Some people believe that he was imprisoned, but he got out of the prison himself and then became Imam al Ghaib. Some people believe that he was martyred indeed, but later on he was resurrected, pretty much like the Christians believe about Jesus. And then he became Imam al Ghaib. And some people said, We are agnostic. They are called La Adriyun. They say, We do not know whether he was before the prison, after the prison, was he resurrected or not. What we believe is that he is the final Imam. He is the Imam Ghaib, and he will return one day, and he is the Mahdi Maw'ud. He is the Imam Ghaib, the Imam of Zaman, the final Imam. That's why they call Waqifiyah. This sect does not exist anymore. This was their belief. And what was the main reason for this? Now, our ulama say, Sheikh Tusi, according to him, the main reason was 
greed for wealth. There were three of the wakala and the representatives of the imam who had collected the wealth, the homes and hedaya and the, the, the gifts and all that that people wanted to send to the imam when he was in the prison. And they were sitting with all that wealth and they thought, if we accept the imam of Imam al Raida, peace be upon him, we'd have to let go of all this wealth. So what did they do? They fabricated this belief. And a lot of people, simplistic people, those who care too much about other people's opinions and do not have the power of discernment themselves or do not use the power of discernment themselves, they started following them and became waqifiyah. And this waqifiyah has an important role to play also in the times of Imam Reza, peace be upon him, and Imam Taqiyya al-Jawad, peace be upon him. And I'm now entering the third and the final part of this lecture. So these waqifiyah people rejected the Imam of Imam al-Reza, peace be upon him. And they said, no, 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 he can't be the Imam. Musa al-Ghazim was the Imam, we are waiting for him. So Imam Reda, God forbid, is the false Messiah, the false Imam. And then it was the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that um, 30 years, until 30 years after the marriage of Imam Ali al peace be upon him, he did not have any child. It had been 30 years since he got married. And then Imam Taqi al-Jawad was born. 30 years and people started to say, how can he be the Imam? He is Abtar. He has no lineage, no progeny, no children. He's definitely not the Imam. And those people who had initially accepted the Imam of Imam Ali al Rada, peace be upon him, and had rejected the Waqifiyah belief, many of them also returned towards Waqifiyah. They said, no, he can't be the Imam. He has no child. If he who would be the next imam? If he has no child, it means that the imam cannot continue. It means that this Ali al Rida is not the true imam. And the true imam was his father, the last imam. That's what they started to believe. There was one man. He's called Ibn Qiyama. His name was. He was one of the prominent chiefs and leaders of uh, the Waqafiyah people, he wrote, a, he wrote a letter to Imam Ali al-Rida, peace be upon him. He said, how can you be the Imam when you have no child? And the Imam wrote back, how do you know that I, am, I do not have a child and I'm not going to have a child? And then the Imam wrote, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to bring an end to this world until he gives me a son who is going to separate haq from batil, truth from the falsehood. The Imam rose back. And then this man himself says that after a while, Taqi al-Jawad was born. This man himself says, Taqi al-Jawad, and then I went to meet Ar-Rida, Ali Ar-Rida, and he said to me, this is the son I was talking about, and this is the son who is the heir to me and to all of Dawood. And Imam Taqi al-Jawad, he is called the Mubarak Mawlud of the Ahlul Bayt, very Mubarak, the most blessed Mawlud. Why is that so? Because by that time, he is going to, to separate the haq from the batil. All the batil had left. Whoever is left with Taqi al-Jawad and the Aimma afterwards is a khalis. No more sects are going to be separated. No more movements starting. Yes, they say that there were some people who stopped at the Imam of Imam Hassan al-Askari alayhi salam. It is written according to Shaykh al-Saduq, but no significant sect emerged. Whoever believes in Taqi al-Jawad believes in the 12 Imams. But it's a great pity that this Mubarak Mawlud and his father were oppressed by their own 
close blood relatives, the brothers of Imam Ali al-Rida and the uncles of Imam, Imam Ali al-Rida, they started to say that he is not his real son. And the Waqafiyah also stoked the, the flames. They also added fuel to this fire for their own personal gains. That, no, 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 he is not his real son. First, they said they had spread the rumor, God forbid, that Ali al-Rida is Aqim. Astaghfirullah, naqla kufr kufr nabashad. They had spread this rumor that Ali al rida cannot have children, first that. And then Taqil Jawad was born. And they said, no, 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 he's not. He's, he, he is his foster son. Why? Why? Because he is too dark. He is too dark. He has a black complexion. Yes. He had a very dark complexion, black complexion. Aswadul loan is the word. And his mother was one of the Nubian women. And the Nubian are the people who live in an area that is a south of Egypt or north of Sudan. So there is a great likelihood that she had a very dark complexion or black complexion. And he was dark. And people said he cannot be the son of Ali al rida So what did they do? One day they invited a physiognom, an expert in physiognomy. Shanas, it's called the one who looks at the features, the facial features of people and tells who could be his father, who could be his uncle, who could be his son, and so on. They invited a group of those Qiyafa Shanas physiognomes and gathered around him, around Taqi al Jawad, peace be upon him. This is in Al Kafi, very famous, very famous uh, event. What did they do? The uncles of Taqi al Jawad, the brothers and sisters of Imam Ali al Rida, peace be upon them both, they gathered around Imam Taqi al Jawad and invited the physiognomes. And that time, Imam Ali al Rida was away from them and wearing ordinary clothes, having a spade, working in the garden. The physiognomes looked at everyone around Taqi al Jawad, peace be upon him, and said, His father is not among you. I can see the uncles of his father, relatives of his father, but his father is not among you. However, that man, that gardener, he could be the father of this boy because both have the same kind of feet. And then they accepted that Taqi al Jawad was the real son of Ali al Rada, peace be upon them both. That is how they oppressed, oppressed the Imams, casting doubts on the Imam. But you know, there is another great pity that until today, some people have a problem with Imam Taqi al Jawad being of a dark complexion or a black complexion. Some people have. Last year, I, a sister sent a message to me that she had an argument with some Shia person who vehemently rejected that an Imam cannot have a black complexion. La ilaha illallah. Because we have not only, some of us, not only have internalized racism, but we are racists ourselves. We are against white supremacy, but we ourselves are lighter skinned supremacists. So much so that we cannot accept that uh, our Imam can have darker or black complexion. And I'm really worried. I tend to say among my friends that one day the Imam of our time, inshallah, may Allah hasten his reappearance. He's going to return. And several of his grandmothers and one of his grandfathers were of darker or black complexion. And if the Imam turned out to be of a darker or a black complexion, we do not know how he looks. But in our minds, he has to look like a superhero with that bright white face, that kind of long hair. And if he did not look like that, he looks darker. People will start to reject that Imam. Because we have not understood the spirit of Islam. We have not understood the soul of Islam. After 30, 40, 50 years of Azadari, we have such a low level of understanding of Islam and the spirit of it. And I'm not talking about you in person as it is quite evident, but I still find it important to make it explicit. But some people think like that.
Why are we like this? When are we going to change? When? If these majlises cannot change our basic behavior and cannot teach us to respect humanity and look at the creatures of Allah as the creatures of Allah and respect every human being regardless of their ethnicity, then what is the point of all this? What is the point of saying that we believe in Ali Murtaba? We believe in Muhammad Mustafa. We believe in Fatima to Zahra, Hassan al-Mushtaba, Hussein, and all the other Imams, peace be upon them all. What's the point of all that? This is just a pastime activity and nothing else. Nothing else. And I want to say, and I want to make it clear that if someone had these kind of ideas, they definitely have not understood the agenda of the Imam of our time. And um, let me tell you, there is a likelihood and a great likelihood that several of our imams and their mothers had a very dark or black complexion. There is a likelihood. And if you have a problem with that, then you are a racist. As simple as that. I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he grants us the tawfiq to understand the spirit of Islam to understand the spirit of the message of the Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam. And he grants us the tawfiq to do tafakkur and seek solutions to our problems, our personal problems, our, our social problems, our ruminations, anxieties, and worries in the kalam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and in the kalam of the mahsumin to, to reflect on the verses of the Quran, to learn about the ahadith of the Ahlul Bayt and find solutions to our problems. I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that for the sake of the prisoner of Baghdad, whose birth anniversary we are celebrating today, he frees us from all the shackles and chains and the prison and the jail that we have created around us in the form of ruminations, anxieties, worries, being worried about what others might be thinking about us, other people's opinions of us, seeking approval from other people. May Allah break all, help us break all those shackles through through the wasila of Imam Musa al Ghazim, peace be upon him, and the wasila of Imam Taqi al Jawad, peace be upon him. I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He blesses the soul of all the departed souls, all the believers who have passed away, and sends His mercy and showers His mercy upon the soul of all the believers. I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He cures all the sick and He gives us the tawfiq to truly and genuinely and sincerely from the bottom of our hearts want to want for the return of the imam of our time and sincerely pray for his return ilahi amin allahumma salli ala muhammad wa ali muhammad wa ajjal farajahum wa an a'da'ihim ajma'in wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh